Good morning. Good morning. Oh. Good morning. Ah. Cup of coffee. Morning cup of coffee, y'all. Come on. It's hot. Whew. Damn. Come on in, everybody. Got to look at my Black Man Mojo t-shirts. My, my initiative for black men. Black Man Mojo. Uh. Probably too hot to drink. Y'all go ahead and grab your cups of coffee. Welcome to uh one of my edition of Morning Cup of Coffee with Rico. You know, I I, I tend to drink tea. Oh, wait a minute. Oh. Mine's kind of hot. Mm. Mm, soothing. So grab your cups. And uh, listen as I um have this uh, conversation. Mm. It's all about citrus. Uh, mm. Go ahead, y'all grab y'all cups of coffee. Probably had it earlier around. Some of y'all probably had your coffee like at eight, seven, well, shucks, six, seven, and eight. Um, I was up earlier, but um, just now grabbing my cup of tea. Mmm. Woo! Mmm, delicious. Ah, just so sip on your cups of coffee as I um uh, as I do my thing. First of all, good morning. This is uh, April thirteenth, two thousand twenty-two. This should be roughly around ten oh one a.m. Central Standard Time, and maybe eleven o'clock in other places, and uh, nine o'clock in other places. And so, good morning. You know, some t there are some nights where I can barely sleep. And then I'm awakened by my thoughts, right? Uh, this morning I was awakened around like 4.30 or 5 o'clock, something like that. 4.30, 4.45 this morning, just my eyes just being, because I know when you're dreaming about certain things and then you open your eyes and it's like, wow, okay. You try to go back to sleep, it's almost like futile. So it's a lot of stuff that's transpired in the media and in this society, that it always it all boils down to this for me, and maybe conversations I've had in the last couple of days. So I have a, uh, you know, just a lot of thoughts about this whole about us as black men, and I know we are not a a monolith. There are a lot we 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 come in various forms, politically. Uh, Religiously, spiritually, economically, educationally, I know. But still, and then now these days, uh, sexual orientation-wise. But still, there's something missing that other groups, even though they are viewed as a monolith, they still can come together as a group to get some things done. And a lot of us as black men, we don't, we have not caught up to what other people are doing. We're still playing this old traditional role of, you know, black men need to do this. Black men need to protect black women. Black men need to be the leaders. You know, damn well, a lot of us aren't mentally or emotionally equipped to be that leader that y'all keep throwing out there. You know, we've gone through this, you know, this whole <laughs> situation of mainly brothers in the last 50 years have been raised by single mothers. And so there's some things about manhood and fatherhood and all that stuff that we kind of missed out on. But we've done a pretty good job because black men, according to the CDC and the Pew Center of Research and others, blackdemographics.com, they all point out that black men are the most involved in their children's lives out of all the other races. And those other races do not and have not ever shared the same experience in America than the black American male. Got it? So I'm always applauding black men. I don't give a damn what you say. I'm always going to applaud, applaud black men because of our mojo as black men. We've endured. Even though other people want to push their stuff to the front because there's some more, there's more funding, you, they can be seen and heard more, but still, when you, when you put the proof in the pudding or uh, put the statistics up based on everybody else, black men still on top. Uh, even when it comes to earning potential, black men still out-earn a lot of folks, believe it or not, even the ones that they're unemployed, they're this. There are a lot of black male entrepreneurs. But I want to start with uh, 
as it relates to black men and us not really understanding the importance of our unity. And if you've been on my lives before, my YouTube channel or my Facebook page, you understand that I'm always pushing for a black male coalition. And I I came up with my own a black man mojo. It's like part of a nonprofit that I'm putting together. I always putting that damn thing together. One of these days I'm gonna actually put my my whole body and spirit and mind and money behind it. But the idea of it, black man mojo. Uh we don't seem to get it. We're still torn apart in so many directions as black men. You know, we don't know if we're gonna be Democrats, and if we dare say we're gonna be Republicans, we're gonna get booed and hissed. We don't know if we're for men or we're for women. We don't know what we, we just pulled in so many directions. And my goal is to get us to be pulled into the right direction. That is for the benefit of black boys and black men, because no one else is going to do it. Now, everyone else has benefited off of our division, off of our ignorance of politics, our ignorance of economics, our, our unwillingness to coalesce as black men. A lot of people have benefited. Uh, even the people that you lay down with, your, your daughters, your wives, they benefited off of you being a black man. How y'all think Black Lives Matters, Black Lives Matter, that organization of Black Lesbians Matter, how you think they, 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 they rose to such prominence? Not just because they was funneled or funded by a white Jewish man, allegedly by the name of George Soros, but also given the blessing of the white LGBT. But what triggered them, that got them on the springboard, was the murder of a young black male. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is that black men are to, to this society. We sit back and play it cool a lot. Matter of fact, we sit back and play cool too much. Because in my opinion, we don't have enough black men who do the research, who put out that research, who have Facebook pages, YouTube channels, have written books, articles, or vlogs, vlogs, or blogs about the plight, the historical and recent plight of black boys and black men. It was a lot of that going on in the 60s and the 70s, but we seem to not, not be up on it. So others are telling our stories, and sometimes they're sharing narratives that are not true. They're pushing old stereotypes instead of looking at the statistics of who we are. We're not even doing it. I don't expect black women. I don't expect white women. I don't expect America to get it right when it comes to black boys and black men because they all benefit from our own. Uh, uh, before. They benefit from our ignorance or our lackadaisical attitude when it comes to our presence in this country. Historically, it's word presently. Let me know as I start talking in circles. You think I'm talking in circles. And we have to be the guardians at the gate, if you will, of black male existence. Black men have to do it. Not biracial men, not gay black men, real straight black men, masculine black men. We have to, not white women, not white Jews, not anybody else. We have to be the guardians of the gate of our own gender, our men, our boys. Because Dr. Jawanza Kanjufu is, a, is an elderly man now. John Henry Clark is no longer with us. Dr. Claude Anderson is close to 90 years old. The scholars who put the research out there, a lot of them are elderly or they've passed on. Even there are women who tried to uh, serve as research or societal or social cheerleaders for us. Dr. Francis Wilson is gone now. We have to pick up the mantle. On uh, YouTube, thank goodness for this, this system or this community referred to as the Manosphere, the Black Manosphere. We have at least three scholars that I know of, four, who are pushing scholastically the agenda of the meaning of the presence of black males. That is Dr. T. Hassan Johnson, brother by the name of the G with the, 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 G with the PhD or the Green Gorilla, Dr. Tommy G. Curry, Tommy J. Curry, I'm sorry, and Dr. Ronald Neal. These are four scholars who are pushing the black male narratives, but the masses of black men have not tuned in to these brothers. And then you have attorneys, or one attorney that I know who's pushing the black male agenda, the, the, the betterment of black males on YouTube. His name is attorney Dennis Sperling out of Houston. 
The lead attorney is pretty cool too. Check out the lead attorney on YouTube. And in that manosphere, you have others. You know, Kevin Samuels, he pushes the importance of black relationships and black men, the importance of black men as it relates to blue collar Henry or high value. But they're there, but the masses of black men are not catching on. Even someone like a minister Jap who's real hood and gutter. If more street dudes can listen to his channel, it may not be to the tape, the taste of the flavor of brothers who believe that they're more educated or more articulate. But our street guys and our younger men can really benefit from what Minister Jap is talking about, except when he started trying to push the white girl on everybody. That's the only part I don't like about Minister Jap. He's trying to push the white woman on, the, on our young men, and I don't care for that. You know, if you're going to talk about black women, don't present a white woman, Minister Jap. Present a better sister. Because if I, I talk about the behavior of African-American women, but I also... My my goal is to push you towards the, the black women who do behave, who do have self-respect, who are not fighting in Walmart, who are not abandoning their children, who are not single mamas or, or as my man uh, Larry Palmer, Mr. Palmer says on his YouTube channel, who's not a baby mama terrorist. There are plenty of black men on YouTube and on social media who are doing it, but the masses of us have not rallied around these messages which will actually, in reality, help out a lot in the behavior. A lot have, but no more need to. Even come to my page, Rico the Opinionist. I'm trying to steer brothers in the right direction. But I know we need to get in the streets more. And shout out to the ones I have not, have I, I have not mentioned. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, Media Tutorial Reviews. That brother, real articulate, smart dude. He's good for black men or men in general, particularly black men. You know, the red pill community is good for the black for black men. Ramon, what's good? So what I'm saying is, as black men, we have to stand up and support us more and, and, and stand up and and celebrate us more. Let me give you an example of how we kind of miss the boat when we allow everyone else to celebrate. I was thinking about Jack Johnson. Y'all know who Jack Johnson is? Jack Johnson was that black dude in, in the turn of the century. Tall, dark-skinned, bald-headed. Some labeled him as arrogant. He was the first heavyweight champion of the whole wide world. He was knocking them white boys out left and right. Could nobody beat him. He won like 100 fights and zero. More than that, probably. So much so that white America created it was called a man law that, uh, about him trafficking white women across state lines. And I don't even, I think they just recently pardoned him because they put him in jail for that because Jack Johnson uh, was knocking the white boys out and they got mad about it. And I think uh, they tried to find the biggest and the whitest guy they could find. I think he had, he was probably in his 40s or 50s then when they fought and they fought to like 17 rounds. And I think probably round 18, Jack probably fell, but who cares? But he had kicked them folks' ass forever. Um, uh, Ramon says, good morning, brother. Put a put a listing of the brothers of their channels up for those who need to get the info. Will do, for sure. Uh, but what we tend to do is not pay attention to the greatness of black men. Jack Johnson, it was a great black man in his field of athleticism. He's a boxer. But as black men, we should be the stewards of the history of the greatness of other black men. We should be doing that, not somebody else. It's time out for us sitting around and kind of chilling while others dote over us or present our narratives. There should be tons of black boys doing the research on other black men and other no, to present the greatness of their legacy. We should be the guardians of the gate, the preservers of the legacies of great black men. Instead of allowing other people to talk about the, the part that's not so great about black men. Let me give you all another example. Ike Turner 
when you go and look at the true history of who Ike Turner was and erase all of that other stuff that Hollywood presented to us, Ike Turner was one of the kings of rhythm, one of the originators of rhythm and blues. He was also a king or queen maker. If it were not for Ike Turner, there would have been no Tina Turner. And yeah, they put out the, the, the whole narrative of him abusing her, but, but she was there for 19 years. 19 years. But she was just Anna Mae Bullock in Nutbush, Tennessee, in the country, until this guy put her on stage and helped her hone her craft and polished her up and made her the icon that she is. But see, black men... Good morning, Della Stone. Good. Let me take a minute. Let me sip some coffee. Good. Mm. 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 Oh, T, good morning. How you doing? Mm. Ike Turner was awesome in his legacy, but we allowed others to rip, rob him of that because of the narrative of him and Tina. But Tina Turner wouldn't have been nothing without her introduction the, the the funding and the polishing from Ike Turner. And we should celebrate his legacy. You don't have to celebrate his bad behavior, but he did leave a legacy in rhythm and blues. James Brown, black men, we should be guardians of his legacy. We you know we remember those last few years when he got a hold to I don't know whether it was Crystal Meth or whatever it was, but James Brown was the originator, one of the originators of rock and roll. He's the godfather of soul music. He earned it. You've seen the videos. He may not have been that great in his personal life, but we, but he did have a legacy that we just let, let slip through our fingers. Sam Cooke. He was referred to as Mr. Soul. Sam Cooke was extraordinary. Tall, chocolate, handsome man, ladies magnet, but most importantly, he could sing, he wrote, he produced, and he opened his own red record label, created his own record label that during those days went against everything those white record companies ever wanted. What well, is for him to create business partnerships or inspire other black artists to own their own masters? to produce their own records, Sam Cooke. But when we talk about Sam Cooke, what'd you go straight to? He was with that woman in that damn hotel and uh, he was in that naked. You know, we think about the seediness of it. We have to stop allowing people to dirty up the legacy of black men. You know who had a dirty real life, but they preserved his legacy? Elvis. Elvis won shit. But white folks made sure White men made sure that his legacy was always celebrated and it always made money. Shout out to Graceland in my hometown of Memphis. And see, it's not up to anybody else to preserve the legacy of black men. It's up to us. We have to do it and do it right. All that other stuff, they're just part of their humanity. But what makes one's legacy so great is their talent. And we as black men, we failed. Michael Jackson, his legacy is awesome. So we can leave out the part. So I can tell you what I thought about Michael Jackson. I thought about Michael Jackson as being the greatest entertainer that ever lived since Sammy Davis Jr., since the Nicholas Brothers, since those black men who, who tapped and they sang and they did acrobatics, they wrote, produced, they did everything. And, and Michael Jackson, in my opinion, inherited all of that. He embodied all of that. But Michael Jackson in real life was a sick son of a bitch. He was a self-hating son of a bitch. But see, he was able to, he, you know, to suck all of the melanin out of your body, to chop your nose off in half and make your lips look like white women and wear white women wigs. But you couldn't take that African out of him. His African talent is what created his legacy. So he should still be celebrated for his, his legacy and his talent. But Michael Jackson as a person, he, he had left the black race a long time ago. 
He didn't really, he didn't start mentioning black folks until those white folks started getting on his ass. And that's pretty much how a lot of these entertainers who go pop and go international, they don't mention black folks until they get knocked down, then they use us to try to come back up. You know, his last albums, Remember the Time and and uh, Invincible, those with Butterfly. See, he was falling off. But I like you, Rock My World. I thought it was, Rock My World. But those other songs were, you know, when he, it's when he was separating from the, the big corporation, the protection of the corporation called the record label. And the list goes on and on. Bobby Womack, we should push his legacy as a musical genius. But in real life, Bobby Womack won shit. And I'm not, <laughs> based on his social behavior, slept with Sam Cooke's wife. And then when his daughter got old enough, he slept with Sam Cooke's daughter. <laughs> While he was sleeping with the wife, according to reports. But his legacy. It's like, Rico, why are you bring the dirt up? You're saying we don't celebrate. So I want to make sure they're human beings. But I, but but we we have to be in charge of pushing out their legacy as black men. And I think that's what we're missing. We don't stand up. We don't promote each other enough. The greatness of us. You understand? And I hope I'm making sense. And I hope we're taking this on as an assignment from here on out. Even R. Kelly. I'm not gonna throw his legacy away because guess who's gonna make money off of it? White folks. They'll they'll give us the alleged pedophile while they take the genius and make millions off of it. Did y'all hear when he was trying allegedly trying to sell his um his his, his masters his his music and nobody wanted to buy it? That's untrue. Because something would have happened to R. Kelly tomorrow if he passed away. His music will more than quadruple in value. See, we should make his music the good ones that we like and his legacy. Great, because R. Kelly is a musical genius. He writes, produces, and he sings very well. He um, sings better than half of these folks out here, most of these so-called new artists today. And we have to keep his legacy alive, his musical legacy. Y'all following me? And I can go on and on about how we, how as black men, we're not doing, we're not doing our due diligence to protect one another. Let me show y'all something that really inspired me to make this video. Uh, they were talking about T.I. I don't give a damn what y'all do with that jackass. Because I didn't appreciate him walking on the stage like he was somebody to tell that lady. You know, the heck of that, that, that sister who was up there telling jokes. She probably wasn't funny, but still, he is not funny at all. He may get funny in 10 years. But um, they, I was watching Comedy Hype, and they were talking about... um. The booze, his booze. Then I saw it on on uh, on YouTube where they did a history of of comics being booed, right? And it came up to this white guy that all everybody black loves. His name is Bill Burr. When Bill Burr first started, he was they showed where he was being booed at a show in Philadelphia in Philly. But he went the he began to roast the audience. It's filled with a bunch of Caucasians and you know, a few blacks up in there, but he was letting them have it. But he said something that was that that even escaped me. I didn't even know. He said, "You bunch of Bama, you know, he's pretty much a bunch of Bama's backwards ass folks. Y'all around here, y'all built an entire statue, a huge ass statue of a fictitious character called Rocky, a loser, fucking fictitious character named Rocky." When you got a real life champion, Joe Frazier, who was right here from Philadelphia because he was black, you read him create a fictitious white hero called Rocky from a movie. And I say, hot damn. I didn't know Joe Frazier's from uh from Philadelphia. Did y'all know that? And so why hasn't um please fill in the blanks? Does Joe Frazier have a rocky size statue in front of a government building like like a fake character from a movie Joe Frazier when you look at his background Joe Frazier was awesome he was one of the kings of the ring and guess what he's very he was very significant in doing Joe Frazier was very significant in resurrecting the boxing career of Muhammad Ali you ever seen the movie Ali yeah 
Joe Frazier. Was it Joe Frazier? Yeah. Very significant in the resurrection of the boxing career of Muhammad Ali. So those of you, you black folks, you black men in Philadelphia, y'all got some work to do. Find the park or a government building. Those of you in city council, you black dudes, y'all have a statue to erect of a real, actual, real life hero from Philadelphia that happens to be a black man. All you, you, uh, you fellas be hollering about, yeah, man, Philly, what's Philly, son? From Philly, son. All right, well, son, get to work on that, that, that rocky size statue of Joe Frazier. Let's celebrate black men. No one else is going to do it. Had there been black men who were aware in Philadelphia, it could have been a Joe Frazier. Now, I'm not from Philly, never been there. So those of you from Philadelphia, maybe I can Google it and see if there's a statue or a bust of Joe Frazier anywhere. Conrad said, uh, just recently, I believe one got put up within the past two years. Is it about to, is it, is it, a, a Conrad, is it as prominently displayed, being prominently displayed as that fictitious Rocky? Is it about as big as that Rocky statue? If not, we need, somebody need to uh, come up with three more million dollars and get him a real statue for Joe Frazier and to share that information that I shared. He was very instrumental in re resurrecting the boxing career of Muhammad Ali. On Oscar night, um, there were three black men that lost. That took an L. Chris Rock, Will Smith, and... Uh, what's his name? Richard Williams. Um, the whole image itself was a loss for black men. And I'm not really concerned about all the banning of Will Smith and the movies. Been I don't care. I, I really don't. And again, Will Smith is my top three favorite actors of all time. And I think Will Smith's legacy should be preserved. But I lo I'm looking at what's going on with him as... Number one, hopefully he finally going to get gets that therapy that he needs. And who cares about them banning his movies? I hope they break all the contracts with him. You know why? Because maybe this was a cry for help, meaning Will Smith probably want to get out of that contract. Because one thing you can do, yeah, you don't have to show us stuff, but we already have Will Smith's movies. You can't kill a legacy that the people keep alive. See, what we do is we allow the system to take somebody out. Instead of us as the people keeping it going. I don't care if Hollywood takes all of his movies, future and past stuff and stop showing them because we still have the DVDs and, and all this other stuff. I just hope Will, in 10 years, he's gotten rid of that bald head Chucky doll, gotten rid of her. He's gone to extensive therapy and... He can come back with a clean slate and probably create not just Overbrook, but I mean, he has his Overbrook entertainment, but can really be free. Because a lot of us don't understand the inner workings of Hollywood. That's a lot of pressure. Three men, three black men lost that night when Will, in my opinion, sabotaged that entire night for a lot of black folks who actually were put on. You know, when Will did that, it took, it really took the shine away from, let's start with Richard Williams. We didn't, <clears throat> we didn't celebrate Richard Williams <clears throat> the way he should be celebrated because we allowed the media to push out a narrative about this man being aggressive and pushy. But when you go watch the movie King Richard or you go back and watch some of the old movie of uh, uh, news reels of him in action, oh, he did exactly what a father does for their, ch their children, particularly their daughters. He protected them. Richard Williams was not the most educated or the most uh, socially quaffed gentleman, but he knew enough from his upbringing and where he lived and where he's from to let you know, no, you will not treat me this way. You will not speak to my daughters this way. They will be awesome. And guess what? They turned out to be awesome. And Will Smith took that away from Richard Williams that night. He also took away the shine from our very own Samuel Jackson 
who finally, after all these movies, quite a few, he should have been nominated for an Oscar a long time ago, should have won. They gave him a Lifetime Achievement Oscar, an honorary, honorary Oscar. And, and to just go back and watch that speech, Samuel was so happy and so great to see him and Denzel just embracing, laughing. And like, you know, two people who've known each other forever. And Denzel like, yeah, man, you finally got you one. You know, it was it was awesome to see. Will Smith took that. When he, when he, cause see, I wonder, I said, did he plan that? Was he given an assignment to do that? To ruin an actual black night at the Oscars? Cause there's quite a few black folks that, that, that shined that night, but Will took it away. And from me, from my observation, observation, a lot of us didn't go and see, well, what really happened at the Oscars? Who? You know, what, what happened? And who was all awarded stuff? Cause the black folks that won some Oscars. Got some awards. And even for his his win for King Richard, which I as I when I watched the movie of a month or so ago, I said, okay, this is Will's time. So for him to purposely shit on his own night, that was so disappointing beyond words. Because different. It would have been such a speech that was been epic. Even the speech he gave was it was it was done. It was ruined. But we still must protect Will and protect his legacy. Because one thing about it, he's done awesome work in the movie industry. Now, I didn't care for Three Degrees of Separation. I didn't care for The Legends of Bag of Vance. I didn't care for Hancock, that movie. But everything else, Seven Pounds and all that stuff, I Am Legend, it keeps going, The Pursuit of Happiness. Even Hitch, I like that. You know, it, it goes on. Will does a great job. Ali, I loved Ali. He uh, he does a great job. And his and we as black men should, you know, uh, rally around him. And I just want to make a correction to those out there who's writing these weird ass articles saying, you know, black men hate Will Smith. We don't hate Will Smith. He's never done anything for us to hate him. We don't hate Will Smith. I don't hate Will Smith. We're disappointed because we knew he was bigger and better than that behavior. And we'd never bought the narrative. He was protecting his wife. We didn't buy that bullshit. Because we understood. See, that right there shows the disrespect of men. We know how men are. We know how other men are. We have expectations of other men. We didn't make him more than human. But based on what he presented to us, we there was an expectation placed on it. He set the standard of particular behavior of excellence. For him to behave that way, yes, it sent a shock to the systems of many of us. I know I couldn't sleep that night. I'm like, well, really? You know, we've also found a new human side of Chris Rock. Three black men lost that night. Chris Rock, Will Smith, and Richard Williams. And hopefully with the 10-year ban, or 10, whatever, I hope he... He goes on and stays away for at least five years, just getting himself together, getting the, getting the divorce papers together, uh, selling that damn house and uh, and get him a cool little spot and get that cute little 25 to 30 yo. And I don't care if she's a spicy Latina or whatever she is, a cute little sister from another country. that's not this American crap. You know, it's feminine and sweet and fine, you know, because he's 53 years old. He looks great in great shape. Yeah, he deserves a cute little 25 and 30, or 30 year old, 25 to 30 year old at 53. You need that old hag that, that's just that little, that, that, that headless horseman that he's married to. Get rid of that shit. But I know a lot of people say, he's never going to divorce Jada. It's what, and that's fine. Y'all rather see a man be that miserable than to be proven wrong. So, no big up, no will. I got you, man. But just get it together, man. Like matter of fact, brothers have already forgiven you. It's just that behavior we're still trying to get past. And Ramon says that's the question: uh, Will he separate himself from that emasculated environment? That is the question. Hopefully. Um. 
<sighs> yeah, and so, you know, we just gonna wish the best for him and uh and don't come back Will, with all it. You know, as you look into your center and you find yourself, and when you go into the cosmo, that's find a real person who you don't come back with that shit. Come back smoking a cigar, bro. And you're chilling. That's how we want you to come back as a happy, wholesome, all put together brother. This this other shit that you've been doing, we don't want to hear that. See that, Will. We want to see the real Will. And hitting a smaller man just because he's allegedly so called and so that your little, that little miniature, uh, <laughs> anyway, that little heifer that you call a wife. He, he didn't insult G.I. Jane. As a matter of fact, he insulted G.I. Jane by making a comparison to G.I. Jane with that little wench. And we have to, we have to celebrate the legacy of black men. And it's, it's, it's work that can be done. We don't have, you know, um, we don't say, well, this stuff is already done. We can still, as black men, as a collective, we have to understand the importance of us, ourselves, as a group. Every group, every group in this country, women's group, uh, Jewish group, Italian, Asian, everyone else has formed a group or a fence around them except for black men in this country. And it has to stop because we're losing in every 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 point at every corner we're losing because we have all these black men around here. And they act now they now black men can sit around and talk about sports all day long. But we can't get you to talk about the things that are really impacting us politically. You know, I'm still tripping that there, there are straight black men who are still voting Democrat. Really? Y'all no, doing that? Obviously not paying attention to the politics. Of America, of America, or paying attention to the politics of this country. We should be voting as a block, but politically we're still kind of behind. We don't even look at ourselves as a group. Our black women have separated themselves from black men. They're their own group. So therefore they're getting all their little crumbs and little funding and all that stuff to be separate from us. You know the Lyndon Baines Johnson plan when they offer them food stamps and welfare to keep black men out of their home? Well, they've, now it's been up the notch to uh, uh, Goldman Sachs giving them $10 billion over 10 years and no no black female had an issue with that. Matter of fact, they were saying, yes, yeah, black girl magic, we're empowered. See, I already know when black men get together as a group, we always include women and children. But when they get together in their own group, they never talk about black men or black boys. All they talk about is women. That's the breakdown in our community. The women have gone out and stayed too long, gone too far. And so I'm telling brothers, hey, it is what it is. We need to get on that tip. Not to separate from them because... It's just in us to protect and provide. But understand the politics of race and gender, the way every group in this country does. But black men and black boys don't understand it because we're still listening to the voices of our mothers in our heads. And a lot of us cannot move forward because we still look at mama as being the you know, God and all this. That's, that's not true. If you've never gone to counseling to the men I'm speaking with, you might need to go and take up this thing and, and understand the process of divorcing the dysfunction of your families. And one of the things I did was I learned the process when I, when I started Grambling State University, I majored in psychology and this concept of divorcing the dysfunction in your family. I, I took on that practice and I did it early. Um, Ramon says exactly, planned divisiveness, yet they don't see it or they don't care. I, I'll just say they don't care, Ramon. Um, and and, and I, when I divorced the dysfunction of my own family, I also did the second thing. I stopped viewing my mother as my mama and started viewing her as a, as a woman, as a regular human being. So a lot of us can't make moves because we still view our mothers as our mama. Instead of viewing her as a human being. Human beings have flaws. Human beings have the, have the ability to lie or tell the truth or to do something dishonest or to mess over you. 
And a lot of black boys do the fact that black men they didn't have any masculine energy or fathers where their mother is their center. And that's unnatural. It's unnatural. You're supposed to have your mother and your father. And your mother is your center of everything. Well, there's, there's problems in that on so many levels. And my mother, I view her as a person. I view her as a human being. And for me, that has made my relationship with her a lot, a hell of a lot better. Because lines can be drawn, lines of respect, lines of admiration. Those lines can be clear. But when it's your mama, you view her as your mama, you allow her to disrespect you as a grown man. There are some grown black men who say, and who are 40 and 50 years old. Man, my mama's still, I'm still scared of my mama. That's inappropriate. That's unnatural. What you doing afraid of your mama? I know he said this as like something, you know, something to say. You don't really mean that you're afraid, but you still let, her, let your mom get away with murder. Literally. Now, if you viewed her as like you viewed as a woman, then you say, okay, well, she is capable of doing these things. Lying, cheating. You know, and, and one thing about, I've been very fortunate. My mom never slapped my face as a child. So I know she went dead. My mom went slapping a, a man's face or her son's face. That never, it was never, I, I'm just so beyond that concept. Y'all have to forgive me. But there's a lot of black males who mothers slap their faces. And then they'll let, they'll let her slap them as grown. Oh, I don't, I, that ain't gonna happen. Mm-mm. So there's a lot of maturation that has, occur, has to occur in the black community, in the black community, in black men and black boys. Dr. Joanza Kanjufu, Michael Porter, they write about, Dr. Uh, Naeem Akbar, right, they write a lot. Dr. Amos Wilson, these men, they write a lot about the development of black boys and black men. And a lot of it is that we have not developed fully, a lot of us, not even so much to even protect ourselves. If you can't protect yourself from your mama, you can't protect yourself from the world. Ramon said, true, I did the same thing early in life. I actually got closer to my, my father and realized a lot of what we were told is, hold on, let me try to press this, not mess with anything. A lot of what we were told is, let me see, is spite and animosity towards our fathers. Yeah. You know, you have to, yeah, that's, you have to be, grow up and be mature enough to get the truth. And so the point of this whole live is for us, for me to just share with us, you know, as uh, Dr. John Henry Clark said about the black community, the African race, we have no friends. But I'm here to tell you, black men, we have no friends. And so we have to learn to be friends with each other. Some kind of way, because we're going to have to navigate our way a little better in this country that we've been doing. Because even politically, we're not even really standing up as a coalition. Polit we just vote because our grandmother, our wives, our daughters, our mothers tell us to vote. We don't even vote independently. And those of us who dare do that, well, you know, we're ostracized. We're called all these names. And y'all saw the videos where the mothers were attacking their 18-year-old sons who decided they didn't want to vote for Joe Biden. Came with all these old narratives. He's a racist. That other man's a racist. You know, if you don't vote for vote for Biden, that's a vote for Trump. All this kind of stuff. Your mama has too much control over you. So, a grown man controls his own destiny. I don't care what your mama says. And we say, well, what about the fathers? Well, hell, a lot of fathers weren't there. Not because they walked away from their families. <laughs> that narrative. And I want to get, I want y'all to understand what a family is. A family is two people who live on a roof, mother and a father, who live on a roof, and they decide to have children out as they, after they got married. This BS about when these, whenever these women get together and say, well, these men need to quit, quit leaving their families. I want to educate you. A family is not some 10th grade girl giving a coochie away under the bleachers at the basketball game. That's not a family. That's just you getting knocked down, little mama. A woman giving her womb away outside of the club at 2.30 in the morning in the parking lot and hit backseat of his car. That is not creating a family, little mama. That's getting your junk knocked off. 
Now, in both of those situations, you decide to have a baby by a man you don't even know or a boy who's just in your third period English class. That's not a family. A family is a husband and wife in a household that create children. That's called a foundation. You giving away coochie at a festival and you don't know who the baby father is. They walk away from their cheer. And, you know, <laughs> that's not how that works. That's not a family. So I need you guys to learn this feminist talk. You know, misogyny, sexism, and men are walking away from their, walking away from their families. No, in the 60s, men were driven away from their actual families and y'all were okay with it. Except for when Dr. King brought up, it's like, well, damn. And Dr. and Sister Shahrazad Ali brought up same two points. Sister Shahrazad Ali said, it's interesting when they was giving out the, you know, the, the free housing and the, the food stamps and all that to the white families. They ain't asked the white father to leave the household. Interesting. Dr. King said, hey, when they were giving white farmers interest-free loans to mechanize their farms, meaning the families, but you didn't give any money to the black farmers and their families. See, the game has always been played, but we, we actually, we pretend that a game isn't still being played on us. We won't even do the reading or the research to find out how we got here and what to do, what, uh, what to do while we're here. We're just kind of going through the motion and, and they're not even using new tricks. Same old stuff. And so when y'all hear women say men walking out from their kids and their children, they're not their kids. If you didn't have that man, that baby within a marriage, that's not his child. That's your baby for the foolishness. That is not your baby. That's hers. If you know how I know it's hers, because when y'all go to court, who's the judge side with? Her and her baby. Who has to pay child support? You have to pay for her and her baby. It's not me talking. It's reality talking. So y'all stop. It. Now, if you want to claim something, cool. But the language is faulty. It's incorrect. She didn't get pregnant by herself. Well, let me say this part first before I get onto the foolishness of the women's side. Guys, I put up a meme that says, um, you don't need to have a girlfriend, a wife, or a baby before you've accomplished your life's goals. And another one that says, don't get, don't have a baby before a bride, fellas. Meaning you have to be selective with your penis. And I also said, don't allow your penis to lead you into debt or to your death. We got a lot of that going on. And so, guys, be careful who you shoot your semen in, right? Be careful. So, okay, ladies, I said that part. But here's the part that we seem to not even pay attention to, guys. Since we, we, we don't seem to be aware of things. Um, it's like... um. When they tell you this, well, he should have wore a condom. Well, how come you didn't use those 25 forms of birth control that you have, ma'am? How come he always has to wear a condom, even though condoms are like 90, 95 to 99 percent? No, uh, that works. 99, 95, 99 percent. But there is a percentage there that it may not work. It may break or something goes on. So if you know he's wearing a condom. Meaning he's wearing a condom to prevent HIV or KID. And the condom breaks and some semen happens to go into your body. Some of you still have the nerve, and you say if you got pregnant, you still have the nerve to try to handle the baby. And then try to put the man on child support when he did everything he was supposed to do to not get you pregnant. But somehow still, if he says, no, nah, I don't want no baby, he's a deadbeat. Fellas, learn the language and stop calling other men deadbeat. Because if that wasn't a husband that actually walked out to his family, there's no such thing as a deadbeat father. Because the women make the choice of who gets between their legs. I don't understand why y'all don't why y'all don't know this. I'm talking to the men. Because the women are already sold that they're they're victims in this. Because I'm I, I learned as a teenager, as a young man in college, and even now, I can't get no punani without permission. She has to open her legs on for me to put to stick my raw penis in her raw vagina. 
And then when she doesn't want to be a mother, guess what she does? She can go and have an abortion. Or if she decides to have it, she can put up for adoption. How come men aren't teaching other young men this? Yeah, we're teaching them. Come on, guys. Be careful where you put your penis. But why Why we have to always put it on the young men? Because what you're saying is, here's the message that you're missing. Having sex with these chicks is a big risk because they have no morals and their goal is to trap you. That's what you're saying. Because when she get pregnant and first thing grown ass women would say, now teenage girl, he should have wore a condom. How was he, how was he not able to wear a condom between your legs, bitch? So you mean every young man that's a heterosexual has sexual urges. If a, and he, and you agree to let him have sex with you. So that means he's having sex at his own risk. What kind of message is that to send out? He has to have sex at his own at his own risk with you. That's weird. And then finally, y'all haven't picked up on this. Man. That is the weirdest thing. It's the weirdest thing. And you wonder why a lot of guys are, are opting out. <laughs> they're like, you know what, damn all that. <laughs> they're they're leaving the country. Or they're trying to get with a group of women who who also enjoy having sex, but they know that I don't I don't want every time I have sex with somebody there's a threat of me getting pregnant. And black men, whenever y'all have sex with most of these black chicks, there's a threat of her getting pregnant because she acts as if in 222 she's never heard of birth control. So she will allow herself to get pregnant. You can wear a condom or not wear a condom. That's your that's your thing. But you shouldn't be made, well, you didn't wear a condom, so that's what happened. It shouldn't be like that in 2022. Handheld drones and iPhone 13 Pro and all this kind of stuff is going on. All this technology, all of these streaming systems on TV, all this stuff. And this help us still antiquated mentally when it comes to birth control? Who does that? So guys, learn to protect yourselves. You know, if you live in a ghetto, if you if you're a young man or a, a teenager, teenage male, 16, 17, up to 19 years old, or if you're a young man in college, 18, 19, up to 22 years old, you know, and especially if you, I love my HBCUs, but especially if you go to HBCU, if you can have sex at Tech, you're probably better off. If you can go down to LSU and have sex, you'd be better off. You can go to maybe what else? Another white school, a big white school, because you living in, in a ghetto having sex, you're going to be somebody's daddy. And your life is going to be slowed, if not ruined. We have to teach young men this. Because young men are not, not going to have sex. So we as older men need to tell, direct them in places where they can have sex. Ramon says ULM. Okay, because I don't think there's too many pregnant black girls, certainly no pregnant white girls in the University of Louisiana Monroe. Cause see, black men, cause white girls at these at these Baylor's and sub SMU's and uh, Knoxville, not I mean UT Knoxville and and uh, UCLA and you no know, all the big you know all the big white schools. Name a big white school that's got forty five thousand white folks and thirteen blacks and twenty immigrants. And go on that campus and show me how many pregnant white girls or girls from India and Asians and all that, Pakistan. Show me how many of those who are pregnant. And if she's from India and Pakistan and she's pregnant, let me know her, her husband's name that's walking right next to her. But if you go to one of our beloved HBCUs, she's going to get pregnant on campus. Now, if she's a black girl to go to these white schools, well, if, she, if all her friends are white, you know, she's Nigerian and hang out with a lot of white white friends. She's not going to get pregnant. And she'll let you hit raw. But she understands 25 forms of birth control plus the morning after pill. White men don't have to. They're, they're not in threat of getting anybody pregnant as much as black males are when they have sex with Hispanic and black and black girls. Particularly the Hispanic girls and the black girls who live in a ghetto with them. So my thing, I'll tell young men, stop having sex in the ghetto because you're going to be somebody's daddy in the ninth grade. You're going to be somebody's daddy. Just as you are getting your scholarship to go off to this big white school to play football, she's going to tell you, I'm pregnant. Y'all just came from prom. 
And you know how many of these black players that go to these big white schools run through the white girls and not one pregnancy scare? But go to HBCU, if he ain't lucky, he'll have three baby dad, three, I mean, three baby mamas on the same campus before he's a junior. So y'all say he needs to wear a condom, huh? So nothing on the girls. That's why I talk to the young men. Y'all beware of that. I can tell you places, fellas, where y'all can go to have sex and have to worry about no damn KID. Because HIV is not what taking black men out. It's KID. It's taking young, this halting black, young black males' careers and their life goals. You say, well, what about the girl? They don't have a problem having no baby because they got child support, food stamps, uh, societal pat on the backs, and all kinds of support. Because Democratic America approves of black girls being baby mamas. But show me how many conservative black girls that's got babies everywhere. I don't name uh, Kim Close, what's that, Closiak, whatever that little black, cute black chick who ran for, I think, uh, congressman out of Baltimore. But Kwasi, Kwasi and Fume won, won the seat. Candace Owens, she know about this baby mama. She ain't reported they had no babies nowhere. And just name any of the black and say, Omarosa didn't have any baby mamas. I mean, baby daddies everywhere. And these are the women that black women seem to hate a lot. Hmm. Y'all get it? It's about, it's about us protecting ourselves and getting the right education to our young men. And that was on my mind today. Black men, stand up and protect ourselves, protect our legacy. Don't let other people shoot the narrative and tell us who we are and talk about us. Shoot out whatever, the, if it's music, if it's athletics, if it's academics, no scholarship, if it's no, and whatever it is, we have to push our names. We have to do the research. We have to push the pictures, the articles, the blogs, the YouTube channels, the, the Facebook pages sharing the greatness of black men or the black man mojo of black men. We have to do it. Anyone else, all they want to do is talk about the negatives. Anyone else, all they want to talk about is how reckless black men are. And we know, doggone whether a lot of black men, more than the ones who are criminals, who are doing excellent things. We have to push that. We all have to be a part of this. That's how you change narratives. So we can sit around and talk about, man, these stereotype us all day long. Well, we don't have to participate in the stereotypes. Pull your clothes up. Stop getting tattoos all on your damn nicks. Tattoos everywhere. You fraternity guys, stop getting all these damn Greek burns. If you're going to get one of them Greek slave plantation burns on your body, get you one and move on. All this shit across here, all this shit down there. When I look at it, I say, look at that burnt up slave. Yeah. Get you one. Okay, get you one on your chest and move on. But all this shit down here, all that horseshoe, K-A-S-I, that S for the spider the sigma and all that shit makes you look crazy. Bad enough, you're getting one plantation branding iron. That's what they used to do to the animals on the, on the, on the farm. They take that branding iron and put R or W, whoever the plantation owner name was, they tss, into the skin of the animal. You got these black Greeks doing that silly shit. I spoke about this when I was a student at Grambling, so this is nothing new. But stop doing all that weirdness. And y'all get on your young sons about these damn tattoos. You know. That is weird. Tell your sons to stop doing that. But then they're the main ones that say, well, you can't judge a book by its cover. I'm here to tell you, I judge a book by its cover every day. If you look crazy, you're crazy. Yeah. Stop with the bullshit. Lips on the neck. Sleeves and shit. But you want to get mad at folks for looking or walking the other side from you or clutching their purses. If you didn't know, they're going to clutch their purse anyway because you're a black male. But you have to add to it. See, a lot of us try to claim that we know what racism is or we live in a race society, but we don't act like it. You know, we don't tend to teach our boys, you know, you are, you are Neo. You are the one. The Matrix, you're a Neo, and in the movie with Jet Li, you are the one. You have to put this in your boy's system. So when they grow up as young men, they'll know how to behave appropriately. 
but you're not doing it. You're so busy trying to put a football in his hand and a base, not even a baseball, but just a football and a basketball in his hand. You don't tell him that he is Neo. He is the one. He is the, he is the return of Christ, your son. But we're not feeding that greatness into him. We're just feeding servitude in these boys. Go out there and run and jump with them folks. Get that little money. You can run and jump. And you can also be a Kyrie Irving. We'll have enough of those in the NBA, by the way. Shout out to Kyrie Irving. You know, men. We have to begin to groom men. Because the feminization and the masculinization of Black America is ongoing. A lot of us just kind of going with it. You know, it's just, it's just, it's just kind of weird. I'm talking to those of you who are fathers to sons. You know, tell them check out them tight ass pants, them tight t-shirts, and tight belts, and tight jackets. You know, you know they have to breathe somewhere. It's just, it's just weird, but. Uh, I know I started on, I started the live a little while ago about talking about the legacy that we have to step up, protect our own legacy as black men. We can't, no, we can, it's our job to protect our legacy, not only our, our artistic legacy, but those of you who are fathers to sons, your legacy, so he can be protective of his own. But anyway, I think I've gone on too long. Uh, but shout out to black men. Long live black men. May we continue to raise strong sons who are racially aware, who are historically aware. So we'll have all these black boys shocked when the police pull them over. They're shocked when racism hits them. You know, you, a lot of your sons who attend these white schools, we weren't doing anything. We were just riding by. And, uh, yeah, sure. Well, you and your little white friends. Yeah, they, they. but all the harassment came your way, even though you're in a car with three other white guys. But you're the one who's getting all the heat or the smoke from the cops. Got to teach. If you're going to send them to those PWIs, you might as well teach how it goes. But anyway, thank y'all for listening. I think I still have enough time where I can go running or jogging or something. Uh, y'all enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, I finished my cup. I think I'm down to one more sip. I'll see y'all for the next, next time on uh, Morning Cup of Coffee with Rico. Peace, y'all.